If you're a regular customer of Target or any major retailer with a sophisticated point of sale and inventory management system, you've probably been given a guest ID, typically a number that is tied to your credit card and your name and that records everything you've purchased in their stores. From this, Target can learn a great deal, both about you personally and about broader consumer trends. One of the things that Target noticed when it began electronically tracking shopping behavior was that women who registered for baby showers, in other words, women who had self-disclosed that they were pregnant, tended to buy larger amounts of unscented lotion, starting sometime around the beginning of their second trimester of pregnancy. Presumably, this reflected something like heightened smell sensitivity. But the reason really doesn't matter for our discussion. What does matter is that the correlation of data gave Target an idea for marketing. Traditional practice was that a retailer would note that a woman was pregnant and then track her purchases. Statisticians at Target put their computers to work, and as they massaged the data, they tried to reverse that practice. Company officials asked whether they could identify customers who were pregnant, not from how they looked or what they said, but rather from what they purchased. And they could. The analysis identified about 25 products that were predictive of pregnancy. As the New York Times noted, taken together, these 25 products became the basis for statisticians to assign each shopper a pregnancy prediction score and to predict within a very narrow window exactly when each shopper's due date was likely to be. In other words, Target could tell that a woman was probably pregnant and could even predict with some accuracy when she was due to deliver, sometime in, say, the first two weeks of September. Armed with this information, Target issued coupons tied to the likelihood that a customer was pregnant and also to her probable stage of pregnancy. Of course, not all of the customers had publicly signaled or even disclosed their pregnancies, but from a marketing perspective, it seemed to be a genius strategy. To many customers, such unsolicited conclusions were intrusive. An enterprising New York Times account into how commercial data brokers use big data and analytics to sell goods found that the program led one angry and unsuspecting father to storm into a Target store and berate employees for sending his teenage daughter coupons for baby clothes and cribs. It turns out his daughter was pregnant. She just hadn't told her dad yet. Because Target's predictive analytics were perceived as too creepy, the retailer made it less precise. So now, today, in a mailing with coupons for baby clothes, you might also find it combined with an offer for television sets. These sorts of predictive analytics are becoming an essential component of Target advertising. Consider what the digital marketing company Quantcast says it can do with data. Let's say that you've watched three videos on Feng Shui in the last 24 hours, that you've read 12 articles on the health benefits of kale in the past week, and that you've spent nine hours in the past three weeks looking at the hotspots for social life in Portland. All of this information quietly gathered and recorded by your mobile phone. Mixing this bowl of seemingly random information along with other data Quantcast says it can predict, with a reasonable degree of accuracy, that you are 30 times more likely to buy a juicer than the average person, and that you are 14 times more likely than average to purchase renter's insurance. Their motto? We're not really psychic, but we're pretty close. Welcome to the world of commercial data aggregators and analytics. Like government spy agencies, Commercial data aggregators are involved in a form of surveillance. And some people actually think the commercial firms are more of a threat to privacy than the government. 
Before Edward Snowden released state secrets about U.S. government spying methods, if you had asked many people who they feared more, commercial data brokers or the government, they might have said commercial brokers. A former colleague of mine at the Department of Homeland Security, Stuart Baker, tells the story of how he went to the DEF CON hacker convention in Las Vegas one year. And when the visitors were asked who they feared more, Google or the National Security Agency, they responded Google by a two-to-one margin. Of course, that was before Snowden. After the Snowden revelations, one suspects the result might be different, given the controversies that resulted. Nonetheless, Baker's story about the hackers at DEF CON is indicative of the general unease with which some people view commercial data collection. Another reason to talk about commercial data aggregators is that they're often the source of information that the government itself seeks to collect to analyze, from your telephone records to your web search activity. The government might buy this data or force the company to turn it over. And so we'll ask two questions in this lecture. First, what are the risks and advantages of commercial data collection and analysis? Second, does our answer change when it's the government that obtains this private sector commercial data for its own uses? Do these problems trouble you? And if it does, what are your remedies? So in this lecture, we'll explore both issues, the commercial collection of data and how the government uses data that is originally collected from, for commercial reasons. Any consideration of commercial data aggregation should begin with two premises. The first is that you are the product. When you click on a link or search the web or send an email and a company collects data about you, they will be marketing that data to others. So what looks like a free service, Google searching, for example, isn't really free. You're gi giving Google or whatever your search engine of choice is something of value in exchange, knowledge of who you are. And that in turn leads to the second premise. You're getting something of value in return. You get the search service without having to pay for it. Search engines and your other web services open up the world to you and frequently don't cost you a penny out of your pocket. So the flip side of thinking about data brokers marketing you is to ask yourself this question. How much would I pay per Google search if it were charged to me and if I had to pay for the service? Frankly, I personally wouldn't know how to value Google search, free email, cloud storage, or my favorite apps. But I do know that instead of paying cash, I get them all for free. And in turn, the host service learns something about me as well. So far, it's been a pretty good deal for each of us. As one presidential review of data collection put it, the velocity, volume, and variety of data collection are increasing all the time. To give you some idea of just how big this market is, Consider this. The commercial data broker Axiom claims to have collected 1,500 data points per person on average on 700 million consumers. It analyzes and markets information about your lifestyle and personal preferences to its partners and customers, companies like Macy's. The information Axiom collects ranges from major life events like a wedding or a baby to your browsing history and shopping habits. And it has begun business relationships with social media giants like Facebook and Twitter. If you wondered, it's a billion dollar a year business for Axiom alone. So let's, let's think about that. How should we regulate this market in me? The Federal Trade Commission has recommended that consumer data brokers be more transparent, and give consumers greater control over their personal information. The FTC chairwoman at the time, Edith Ramirez, said, We found that data brokers collect billions of pieces of data on nearly every American consumer, 
often merging online and offline information. Ramirez said, Data brokers are also making potentially sensitive inferences about customers, about their health, financial status, and ethnic backgrounds. And consumers have little, if any, window into this process, let alone meaningful control or choice about how their data is shared among businesses. In response to that problem, the FTC said that Congress should consider enacting legislation to make data broker practices more visible to consumers and to give consumers greater control over the immense amounts of personal information about them collected and shared by data brokers. Distilling her view into one thought, FTC Chairwoman Ramirez said, quote, We need better transparency into how data brokers collect and use our personal information to help ensure that we not go down a path that leads to unfair exclusion, but rather one that widens opportunities for all consumers. That was the start of a campaign to increase government control over data broker activities. So where will this lead? What's likely to happen in the next few years? At least two results, I think, seem certain to follow. First and foremost, the growth in regulation of data brokers is part of a broader trend to regulate and control the collection of data generally. The arc of the law and policy is increasingly in favor of regulated data collection, analysis, and use. As the general counsel of Microsoft has put it, data will soon become a regulated commodity. Second, in the consumer context, expect that regulation to rely on something called the principle of responsible use. Responsible use is the idea that instead of focusing on privacy protection efforts and anti-collection rules, the appropriate focus is on rules relating to analysis and use. The rationale behind the idea is that it's becoming increasingly difficult to place collection limitations on new technologies. As a consequence, data brokers and cloud storage providers can no longer be effectively regulated through restrictions on their tools of collection. That's because collection limitations fundamentally destroy the value of big data aggregation. The whole point of data collection is to discover something new and different, like what Target did with pregnancy. As the White House Council of Advisors for Science and Technology said, limits on collection defeat the positive benefits that big data enables. New, non-obvious, unexpectedly powerful uses of data. Inevitably, this will mean that data brokers and those who store data for the brokers will be scrutinized for how they use the data they collect. Former Secretary of Homeland Security Michael Chertoff and one of his senior advisors, Mary DeRosa, have written that the right way to gauge privacy protections is through consumer expectations. We need a, a flexible conception of responsible use that responds to the context in which data is provided. We all assume, for example, that the data we provide to an app developer can be used to improve the app we've purchased. By contrast, we have a much higher expectation of privacy when that data is collected by the app developer and traded to third parties. The FTC's regulation of commercial data brokers is just beginning. Increasingly, aggregators who collect data from consumers will need to be careful how they use it. Because if they aren't careful, they can anticipate a challenge from the government. Let's turn now to the second of our topics. The government's use of commercial data for its own purposes. It's difficult to measure, but almost everyone is quite sure that the private sector collects by volume more data than does the National Security Agency or any other government agency. After the 9-11 terror attacks, the intelligence community recognized the value of that data. To cite just one example, airline companies routinely share passenger travel records with the government 
so that the government can assess the risk of international travelers arriving in the United States. In general, when the government requested assistance after 9-11, commercial providers cooperated in the interests of national security. Where they were unwilling, the providers were often compelled by law to cooperate. In time, however, that choice has become more uncomfortable for the commercial sector. Often, it now sees cooperation with the government as a public relations burden that it prefers not to bear. And so, for example, today, Google is encrypting information to avoid NSA scrutiny. Other companies, like Apple, have limited the amount of data they hold as a way of avoiding the obligation to turn it over to the government. As Apple has said in a public report, we have no interest in amassing personal information about our customers. We do not store location data, map searches, or serial requests in any identifiable form. Meanwhile, other countries are reacting to American efforts to use commercial data for government purposes. The trend globally is towards something called data localization requirements. That is, legal obligations imposed by other countries to keep data in the country of origin. For example, Brazil is considering whether to require commercial providers to keep data on Brazilians onshore in Brazil. Russia has demanded that companies like Apple keep data about Russians in Russia. Germany has done likewise and has even gone so far as to banish a large American telecommunications company, Verizon, from competing on German government work so as to avoid the possibility that the U.S. government might compel the U.S. company to turn over sensitive information on its foreign ally. In short, it's a mess. Government access to commercial data is creating cross-currents that put companies under competing legal obligations and that are eroding traditional international cooperation. Let's use one of these events to kind of pull the mess apart and into manageable pieces. I did some work on this matter for a private client, so my views are a bit biased here, but I'm going to make the summary as neutral as I possibly can. In December 2013, Microsoft received a warrant from a magistrate in the Southern District of New York, directing the company to turn over content and metadata relating to a Microsoft user whose records were stored in the company's Dublin, Ireland data center. Microsoft had assigned the customer's content-related records to its Ireland data center based on proximity to the customer, who was European. Meanwhile, the non-content metadata, the to and from line, about the customer was stored here in the United States. It's a perfect example of separate jurisdictions in the virtual world. Taking a practical approach, Microsoft, which is, of course, a U.S. corporation subject to U.S. law, produced the non-content metadata associated with the user and stored on its U.S. servers. But Microsoft objected to the warrant for content-related information stored in Ireland. How would you argue the case? How would you decide it? Microsoft argued that compliance with the warrant would require an extraterritorial search and seizure of data located on servers in Ireland. That type of seizure, they said, is not authorized under the applicable statute, the Stored Communications Act. In Microsoft's view, a search of digital data takes place where the data is physically stored, not at the point from which the data is accessed. Microsoft has not argued that Irish law prohibits the company from complying with the American warrant, but it has noted that the U.S. government could instead use diplomatic means and an existing treaty with Ireland to secure the content data with Ireland's agreement and cooperation. On the other side of the coin, the federal government's argument is based on the location of the service provider rather than the location of the data being sought. Since Microsoft is located in the United States and has control over the data, the government argued that it can and should be obliged to comply with the warrant. 
In addition, the government contended that a decision in favor of Microsoft would have much broader implications, signaling to criminals that simply registering as a non-U.S. account holder would allow them to escape the Story Communications Act warrant and avoid federal scrutiny. The Federal District Court in New York adopted the government's argument and said that the government's order was valid. Microsoft was required to disclose the content of its customers' files even though they were stored outside the United States. Microsoft has since appealed the matter to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. And I'm going to leave to you the task of researching the outcome. I'm pretty confident that if you type the terms Microsoft, Dublin, Ireland, Data Center, and U.S. Court of Appeals into a Google search engine, or better yet, into Microsoft's Bing search engine, the answer will come right up. But whichever way the case ultimately turns, it will have international implications. Why? Well, for one thing, American cyber policymakers might soon be put to a test that challenges their consistency. Consider the announcement by Alibaba, the Chinese e-commerce company, that it planned to open up a new data center in Silicon Valley. From a business perspective, the decision made perfect sense. The center would allow Alibaba to expand one of its product lines, cloud services for businesses, into the American market. It demonstrated an effort by Alibaba to go head-to-head -head with other cloud service providers, such as Amazon, that lease computing systems to businesses. Whereas before Alibaba's clientele was almost exclusively Chinese, the new data center was part of an effort to become more international. And that was sure to give American policymakers heartburn. The U.S. says that U.S. law gives it the right to compel evidence from U.S. corporations anywhere in the world. Therefore, to be consistent and not hypocritical, the U.S. must similarly recognize foreign oversight of foreign corporations on U.S. soil. Let's assume for a moment that the American government's view of the current law is right, that it that is, that the government has the legal authority to compel an American company to disclose any information in its control wherever in the world that information might actually be stored. If we accept that view, then of necessity, we must be logically consistent and say the same is true of American data stored on the Alibaba server in Silicon Valley. The Chinese government is legally free to compel a Chinese company like Alibaba to disclose any information in the company's control, even if that data is stored in America. And by the logic of our own government's argument, the laws of the United States are irrelevant, even if the data is on American soil and pertains to American citizens or business dealings. I think that most American citizens would be surprised to learn that American privacy and civil liberties laws are inapplicable to their own data housed on American soil. And so the Alibaba announcement highlights a confusing and difficult choice for American policymakers. It also means that citizens are now faced with another level of question. Whose cloud services should you prefer? Facebook's, subject to American law, or Alibaba's, under Chinese law? I think you can see from these stories about Microsoft and Alibaba that the current legal structure creates perverse incentives. Technologically, the most economically efficient place to store data is a product of a, of a number of factors like climate, infrastructure, and proximity to users. Laws, I think, should foster that efficiency, but not at the cost of a loss of an individual or corporation's rights and privileges and privacy. One bad result would be if some jurisdictions, perhaps out of authoritarian interest, used legal rules to force companies to store data locally, even though it isn't the cheapest or best place. Another bad result would be a race to the bottom. That is, where nations create data rules that are favorable to their own domestic interests while disregarding the globalized nature of the network. In this example, the law could be used as just another type of trade protectionism.
A free-for-all of competing nations fighting over commercial data rules serves nobody's long-term interests. But it's a natural consequence of the ad hoc web of domestic laws and international treaties that have grown up in the age of fast-changing technological boundaries. We probably need to rethink our entire way of approaching the use of commercial data by governments, perhaps even on a global scale. That's an ambitious, perhaps impossible undertaking. But the alternative is worse. Meanwhile, American companies are losing one of their competitive advantages because of concerns about government surveillance. That edge is the legal system in which technology innovates and evolves. Inconsistent legal obligations put data holders in a nearly untenable position. Though a nation like Germany can demand localization, other nations are not obliged to honor that determination, and many nations' laws conflict with those requirements. For example, the United Kingdom's Data Retention and Investigatory Powers Act says that it can demand data stored overseas. But German law says that German companies can't give data to the UK. What's a company caught in the middle supposed to do? Indeed, a patchwork of inconsistent laws makes it difficult, though not quite impossible in some instances, to operate a cloud-based system. According to the Business Software Alliance, that's a trade group that represents the global software industry before governments and, and in the international marketplace on legal and regulatory problems, including the lack of legal protections and conflicts of law, have substantially impeded cloud computing growth. Consumers outside the United States are losing trust in American tech companies. Anecdotal evidence abounds that American companies are losing business because of perceptions that they're vulnerable to U.S. law enforcement evidentiary requirements. Estimates vary as to exactly how much this will hurt the bottom line. Some suggest that as much as $20 billion or $35 billion annually in potential revenue will be lost. As with most such estimates, the true costs are impossible to know with certainty. The flip side of this problem is, I think, equally troubling. It might be, as Microsoft said in the case over how the U.S. government should, should proceed in securing private records overseas, that part of the answer lies in diplomacy. We have a mutual legal assistance treaty with Ireland. That's a treaty that sets out how and when U.S. and Irish law enforcement will cooperate with each other. And it seems likely the Irish would help American law enforcement and intelligence agencies with legitimate interest to secure the data they need to conduct an investigation. But not all nations are as reasonable or as friendly as Ireland. Some, indeed, are inimical to American interests, and possibly to the interests of many other nations. A Chertoff Group white paper noted that, quote, the trend towards data localization carries with it the risk that countries might develop rules that make them data access black holes where malicious actors can find a safe haven from legitimate scrutiny. This is precisely what's happened in other large-scale criminal activities, ranging from the international drug trade to offshore financial centers that facilitate tax evasion and money laundering. It is, sadly, unlikely, at least today, that diplomatic cooperation will enable us to chase criminals or economic spies who hide behind the walls of Russian or Chinese law. Thus, at a time when economic pressures and civil liberties concerns are driving us to respect the internationalization of commercial data, we're also being forced to come to grips with the lack of a uniform agreement across the globe on what, if any, types of surveillance and scrutiny ought to be lawful. Commercial data collection is of powerful use to the commercial enterprise that collects it and to the governments that analyze it. But there's absolutely no global consensus on how personal or other private data can or should be used, stored, 
transferred, sold, or safeguarded. Without that consensus, we live, in effect, in a digital wild west, without law or order.